Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, my name is Ahmed Dibyushi. I'm your host for this very exciting webinar, especially that, that we have very uh, honorable guests and speakers as well. And uh, while we're waiting for others to join, let's have just a quick uh, poll to see uh, how um, you feel about uh, crypto, uh, which is our topic today. Okay. So I'm launching the poll, if you could please vote. So as a status, okay, when it comes to crypto, you are currently what? Are you already trading, investing in crypto? Are you mining a crypto? Uh, or you're considering trading, investing, uh, mining crypto? Or you will never consider crypto for trading or investing? Okay, or you're just learning about crypto in this from this session. So I'll appreciate if you could uh, give us your answer. Panelists, you can also uh, chip in. Yeah. Unfortunately, you cannot vote, Ahmed. You're, you blocked us from voting. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can talk about our experience, no worries. Okay. And the first thing I will ask the panelists, are you investing in crypto or not? Yeah, and if, uh, uh, that would be inshallah in the Q&A. Okay. So I'm currently having uh, 21 uh, answers. Um, let's wait for a few moments as well for others to cast their vote. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, inshallah, I'll share with you the results as well. Okay. So, Fawaz, what do you think would be the majority of uh, answers? In your I opinion? think um, yeah? the majority, I think, just learning about crypto. My opinion, okay. my opinion. All right. Khaled, what do you think? I'll probably say the same, but having seen some traction in Bahrain, it could actually be already trading, investing in crypto. So it's okay. either okay. just learning or already trading. OK. All right. All right. So we have around uh, nine, 90 people, 90% 90 of the participants already um answering the questions so i'll end the poll okay i will share the results okay so the, these are the results okay so as you guys predicted uh just learning about crypto uh interesting at 26 percent this is a good number as well uh, that's already trading and investing inshallah we'll uh, talk about this uh, more maybe during the panel uh, discussion. So uh, let's give it a start. We have around uh, 30 attendees uh, so far. OK. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Ahmed Bidyushi. I'll be your host uh, for this very interesting webinar. We have an, uh, a distinguished uh, speakers today. And we'll, uh, I'm sure that we will learn a lot uh, from them. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Mishal Al Hello. He's the chairman of uh, TBS, Technology and Business Society, for his welcome note. Mr. Mishal, you're, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, tonight. Um, I hope everyone will enjoy uh, the session and will learn. Uh, from whatever we will be uh, talking about. Definitely, the subject is very interesting for everyone. I can see people around us everywhere uh, wondering whether they start trading, whether they should entertain the concept. They don't know whether they understand the concept or not, uh, which is fine and, and fair. Uh, surprisingly, that my kids starting uh, asking, can we open an account and do trading? And uh, all of their friends or colleagues of the class, they already started trading, which is uh, what's going on. That's something uh, we need to catch up, seems, in our age. Uh, they are much faster than us on getting there. 
Um, just a quick introduction um, about TBS for definitely we have a new joiner in our events tonight. Uh, TBS basically founded in 2012 with a, a group of 15 founders at that time. Um, we're lucky that we have a very clear uh, and shared vision uh, during 2012 that we would like to contribute to the success of the society and to the success of, uh, of the country. We see a big potential for Bahrain to become a leader on the region and, and not just the region, even beyond. So we started building uh, or uh, setting up objectives at that time. And Alhamdulillah, we have completed uh, almost, I would say within the coming two or three months, we completed 10 years of the establishment of TBS. A lot of uh, collaboration happened during those 10 years. A lot of ideas came up. A lot of efforts from the members and board of directors. Uh, we're so proud of what has been accomplished, yet we have a lot to give. We would love to see Bahrain advance, and we believe that uh, NGOs have uh, a great value to give to the country. Uh, so we would like to support government initiative by uh, definitely bringing uh, values from awareness, from uh, think tank, from uh, even legal views on how things should change on the future. Uh, so we are so excited, definitely. And we have a new board of director uh, appointed last September, um, and they have uh, great ideas. We definitely will share a lot in the coming period. Uh, regarding the event tonight, uh, we are uh, definitely, uh, we'll answer a lot of the questions. But my hope is that you will get out of this event with more questions, because that's uh, the, the part we believe that will create a value by having more questions outside this event. Would like the dialogue to continue. We'll definitely have uh, follow-up sessions on, uh, on this specific uh, topic and, and more. Uh, so we're looking forward to see you again in uh, our event. And good luck to Khalid and, and Fawaz. You are in a good hand with uh, our brother Ahmed and wish you all the best, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mishal, for the introduction. And, uh, you know, a very good reminder that at the end of the session, you will, uh, you will get a survey where you would like you to rate the, uh, uh, this webinar, but also tell us what events you would like to see more from uh, TBS. Thank you, Mr. Mishal. Now we move to uh, our uh, uh, esteemed uh, uh, guest, uh, Mr. Fawaz Shikrallah. Uh, Fawaz is the head of IT at uh, Bahrain Institute for Political Development. He's an expert in blockchain and he's also certified blockchain expert. So the floor is yours, uh, Fawaz, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for the introduction, and I, I welcome the whole team and the whole panelists, um, Khalid Saad and Mishal, and thank you, Mishal, for the introduction. So we can go ahead and start. I'm just going to share my screen. If you can just give me access to share. Okay. Okay, perfect. I assume everyone can see my screen? Yes? Okay, perfect. And everyone can hear me clearly? All right, perfect. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead. So special thanks for Technology and Business Society for making this possible and for the whole team, the organizers to make this possible. I think we have a special event and a lot of interesting concepts coming around cryptocurrency and I'll be, I'll be covering the cryptocurrency foundations, whether you are trading, whether you have some experience, whether you're considering, you want to learn more about it. I'll cover some of the basic uh, principles and we'll talk about what you can do, what you should not do as a trader, as you're getting into the cryptocurrency space, what you should consider, what you should not consider, do's and don'ts, things like that, right? So let's go ahead and begin with the whole case. Uh, first of all, this is a small disclaimer. Um, this presentation is not investment advice. Please do not take, uh, take this as any kind of financial advice. Uh, it is um, the TBS Society and the members and the speakers are not accountable. If you do invest, if you lose your funds or if it doesn't work out, uh, please trade safely and trade at your own risk. 
Uh, this is only for educational purposes, just to get, give you more awareness about cryptocurrency trading, what you can do, what you can do, and please invest at your own risk and always, always, always invest in money you can afford to lose. That's always the general term for any investment product going forward, okay? So I think we have about 35 minutes. So I'll cover this and we'll, we'll, we'll jump into the panel discussions where we're gonna answer some of your questions about crypto along with the panelists. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know your opinion about something. Do you think you can make $1 million in profit in trading cryptocurrency? I'm gonna put the poll um, in the chat. If you guys can just uh, click on it and uh, you can uh, answer it. Let me know your thoughts on it. Just one second, I'll put the chat. Where's the chat? So let me know what you guys think. Do you think you can make $1 million in crypto in profit? Yes or no? What are your thoughts? Let me know what you guys think. Yes, 100%. No. Let's see, 86%, 75%, 40% no. 40%, oh, interesting. No, 55%. Okay, let's see. Let's see, okay. Well, All right. The answers are volatile as the cryptocurrencies themselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 47% said yes. 44% said yes. No. 53%. Okay. We still have answers coming in. 50-50. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Interesting. Interesting uh, answers. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the answers in a second. Okay. I'll have one more question to ask you guys. Okay. So we got 48% that says no, uh, says yes, you can make a million dollars in profit and no, 52%. Okay. That's the final thing. All right. Okay, so I'll jump to the, to the answers in just a second. Now we'll go to the next one. The next question is, do you think it's likely, which is, this is a very important question. Do you think it's likely that you can make 1 million in profit in three months or six months, right? Do you think it's likely you can make a profit of, of trading cryptocurrency in three months or six months? I'll just put the, uh, the poll here in the chat and let me know what you guys think. <clears throat> okay, you think you can make a profit in one million in one million dollars profit in three months or six months? Yes. No. Okay, yes, 35%, no, 65%, no. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there, okay. So you can make one more profit in three months or six months. 62%, no. All right, perfect. Okay, 62, so the majority is saying no, and 36% are saying yes. Okay, so to answer the first question, can you make a one million profit in trading cryptocurrency? The answer is yes, you can, it is possible. It depends on what coins you trade. It depends how much money you're going to invest. It depends how much research you conduct. It depends how much you're willing to wait. It is possible to make 1 million profit. Now, the second question, is it likely you can make a profit of $1 million in profit in three or six months? Okay, statistically, and based on wallet um, statistics, uh, the answer is no. The majority of people who trade cryptocurrency within three to six months, they lose money. The majority of people who trade cryptocurrency within the first three to six months, they lose money. It was almost 70 to 75%, right? After that, of course, the 30% do make a profit. But after that, after six months, that's when the majority start making money, start making profits, right? So keep this in mind as we go through the presentation, all right? So interesting answers, all right? So let's, let's go ahead and jump back to the slides. All right. So... So uh, here's some, 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 some actual examples of average people in New York. This is the New York brother, uh, brothers in New York who actually made over a million dollars in profit within 10 months of trading cryptocurrency. It's called Shiba and Yuan coin. And they actually invested $8,000 over the course of 10 months. And they were able to make over a million dollars returns on their investment, right? So they became multimillionaires from just this one coin. So it is possible, definitely possible, right? Another example, this is published by the New York Post. These are average people 
This is Rachel Siegel, the substitute teacher who became a millionaire after investing in cryptocurrency. Uh, this guy is actually a, uh, an ex-Marine um, from the Special Forces. He actually traded in cryptocurrency in 2018. And this person here is Leah Thompson. She traded in cryptocurrency in 2017 after going to a party of people who are talking about cryptocurrency. It was a theme about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And she invested and she was able to make over a million. And she has a blog now and she talks about cryptocurrency. So you, these are average people, average individuals. And the same story happens across the world in Europe and UK as well. And average people who actually made a lot of money. And I'm sure you guys heard similar stories of that as well. So it is possible, but at the same time, it's also not possible. So here's the flip side of crypto, right? Here's the bad news, right? The flip side of cryptocurrency. This is published uh, 10th of February, uh, last uh, five days ago. More than half of Bitcoin investors are in the red, the study says, right? Currently, more than half of Bitcoin investors are in the red, which means they are losing on their investments right now. As of this moment, obviously, because there was the Bitcoin went into a major dip about two, three weeks ago, and this affected almost all cryptocurrency coins across the entire ecosystem, right? And this, obviously, we know now, Bitcoin is a major driver of all other cryptocurrencies going into the market. So when Bitcoin goes up, all other cryptocurrencies are going up. When Bitcoin goes down, all other cryptocurrencies go down as well. There's a re direct relationship between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. We're going to see why that is. So this is a report published by the United Nations Conferences on Trade and Development in 2019. And the numbers are shocking, right? So here, when you see the, ge the geography of the digital economy is highly concentrated in two countries, mainly US and China. And 75% of all patents related to blockchain technology is owned by US and China, leaving only 25% for the rest of the world. Now, this is a clear indicator that US and China believe and that the, the future of the digital economy is going to be dependent on blockchain technologies, cryptocurrencies being one application of blockchain technology. And this is already happening, right? This is now already happening. Before, five years ago, it used to be just theories and studies. Now it's 100% fact that the future of the digital economy is going to be reliant completely. And um, a big part of it is going to be reliant on blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies being one part of it, right? So just to keep in mind, um, the relation between blockchain and cryptocurrency, blockchain is a technology that cryptocurrency works on. Basically, it's like this, the same way that we say um, email cannot work without internet, right? You have to have internet to be able to work to send emails, video streaming. So email is a type of an application on the internet. Video streaming is another type of an application on the internet. So cryptocurrency is a type of an application on blockchain. Right, then you have smart contracts is another kind of an application on the blockchain, right? You have tokenization. So keep this in mind as we go through the presentation, right? Blockchain is the main technology, which basically means that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin cannot exist without blockchain, right? But blockchain can exist without cryptocurrency, without Bitcoin, because there are other applications on the blockchain that can actually work. This is an example of a cryptocurrency token called Terra Luna. And if you bought this coin in, uh, in February last year, in 2021, the, the price was $6.51. And the price one year later, 11th of Feb, four days ago, was $50. So you can imagine the jump of profit that you could have made. If you made that investment back then a year ago and you sold it today, you would have made a handsome, oh, that's over what, 300% 300, 300 profit just by owning one coin. So this is some of the opportunities that are available in cryptocurrency tokens. Terra Luna is one type of an, what's called alternative coins, altcoins as we talk about it, right? So I'll talk about the history of cryptocurrency. I'll talk about regulation of crypto assets. And then I'll talk about some exchanges and how we can options for us to be able to start. And then we'll talk about the current status of cryptocurrency and what other applications that we have with cryptocurrency, okay? So first, let's talk about the birth of, crypto, uh, of Bitcoin. We have to go back into to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. We all know those dark days, those very, 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 very difficult days back then when the world economy was sinking so fast like the Titanic and almost every industry was impacted. Banks stopped lending money because of credit crunch. Real estate prices were, were, were impacted. People lost their, 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 um, their savings accounts their retirement funds and so on. There was layoffs on global scale across all the entire banking sector. The biggest investment banks 
went down, went bust, and so on. And then to make matters worse, the um, until today, not a single one of those uh, world uh, biggest banks on, on Wall Street, the executives or directors or the financial analysts or the CEOs and CFOs, they weren't even prosecuted in court, right? Because we now learned the real truth that these the banks were actually responsible for the financial crisis. So there's a movie on Netflix called The Big Short. It's based on a true story. And it shows you exactly that, um, that basically uh, how the financial crisis happened and how the big banks were directly responsible for creating the financial crisis to begin with. And until today, not a single one of those executives was even prosecuted in court. And to make matters worse, the US government passed what is called the TARPA, uh, Total Asset Relief Program. And they passed a $700 billion package to rescue those banks who were responsible for creating the, the financial crisis to begin with. So if you go down to like in Southern California, a guy by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, who is unknown until today, he said, based on the system, I cannot trust the banks. I cannot trust uh, these Wall Street banks because if these guys had the chance to do it again, they would have had the same uh, chance to do it over again because they know that they can get away with it, right? They, they, um, they can get away with it. So it goes back to the same principle that if the person knows that he can get away with making money or on the side or under the table, and he knows he's not going to get caught, he will just, there's nothing stopping him from doing so. And these executives had that chance and they know that they, they all walked away with their salaries, with their bonuses untouched. Well, meanwhile, the government passed a $700 billion package, which was taken from the taxpayers of the US uh, American public to pay for this problem. So Satoshi wrote a white paper and he issued it back in 2009. And he made the first transaction, he called it Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronics funds, funds transfer system. And he joined forces with other technology professionals and they created Bitcoin. And the history then carries forward with, as we know, we, we all know. Then five years later, a guy by the name of Vitalik Buterin, he was very interested in how Bitcoin works, the technology behind Bitcoin, and what makes Bitcoin successful that now for the first time in the history of our world, you can move money from person to person across the world, across different countries, skipping the banks and skipping the high fees that banks charge. So now Vitalik said, now, how can I use the same technology and apply it into corporate applications, into enterprise applications, into new applications which the general public can actually benefit from? Because Bitcoin was only for fund transfer system between person to person or peer to peer. Vitalik said, how can I use the same technology and apply it into corporate applications, allowing the business enterprise to benefit from this technology and give them the opportunity to launch new products and new services which would give them new opportunity for them to improve their value, their value offerings for their customers. And so he wrote a white paper called Ethereum, and he joined forces with other technology professionals creating Ethereum. And in 2015, Ethereum was launched. Ethereum brought for us a brand new economic model in 2015. Um, one of the main ones that are very popular right now is called token share ownership. Token share ownership allows you to actually tokenize shares of assets using cryptocurrency tokens. For example, you can now own a, a share in an apartment in Burj Khalifa, maybe 20%, maybe 30% with token share ownership. And you can actually own that share and you can sell that share to other people, right? And this is now possible in Dubai and in other real estate assets in the UAE and in the UK and US, right? So this brought up a very important concept about token share ownership and how you can re realize and apply token share cryptocurrency tokens on real estate assets. Let's take a look at how that works. But first, transactions on the blockchain, very simply, transactions on the Bitcoin is just like, just like Fauri and Benefit Pay. You're able to go and make a payment or send a transaction from one person to another, and the person will receive it, and you can change, modify, or delete the transaction, right? It's permanently recorded on the actual decentralized ledger. Nobody can change or modify. You can't call the bank and say, I made a mistake. If you make a mistake, if, you, if I send one Bitcoin to, um, to Ahmed, I have to convince him that, oh, I sent it to you by mistake. Please send it back to me. Only Ahmed has the, the decision and authority for, for him to send the transaction back to me or send me the transaction. I can't change, call the bank and reverse that, right? This is, a, uh, this is deliberately designed into the system to avoid the risk of fraud into the application. Now let's talk about the token of exchange. Token is like the Dubai Metro. When you go to Dubai, you use the Metro, you have to use the null card. 
you have to put cash into the null card, right? It has value. A token is a medium of exchange which has value for exchange of services. You can only use a null card in the Dubai Metro to go from one station to another, but it has value because it has cash value. You put 100 dirhams, 200 dirhams, or 50 dirhams in it for you to be able to actually use it and go from one station to the next. You go to Magic Planet, you take your kids to play in the games. You have to put the cash value on the Magic Planet card. You can't use the games without the Magic Planet card. Uh, Magic Planet, in this case, is token of exchange because it has value for you to be able to use the games and let your kids play in those games because it has cash value. So BTC, Bitcoin, is a token of value. Ether is a token of value because you can transfer it to actual cash value, which you can, which you can actually um, exchange for actual services or cash value, right? So the process of tokenization, you can take an existing asset such as a building or an apartment or a hospital, and you can divide those shares using tokenized crypto assets, and you can sell those shares to different people around the world. A person can go and own 10% of a hospital. A person can go and own 5% of an apartment in Burj Khalifa or any other Skyrise apartment in London or Tokyo in the US. And that's, is, that presents a very huge opportunity for using tokenized share ownership for you to be able to maximize your investment. It no longer you have to have a million dollars for you to be able to subscribe to a specific building or a high value real estate asset in Manhattan or New York. You can actually own a 10% stake in an apartment in New York and be able to sell that share when that apartment gets ready or if it gets sold and the, and the price of it appreciates. The same thing happens on different apartments, malls, shopping malls. And, and this is now already happening for hotels, for, um, for hospitals, for even uh, apartments and real estate assets in London and Dubai and in New York City as well. Okay, So this is one of the reasons why Ether, Ether Ethereum price jumped from $1,391 in, in January 2021 to uh, $2,700 in January 2022, right? This is one of the reasons why Ether price jumped because now the majority of token share ownerships are happening on the Ethereum price on it, okay? So now let's talk about regulation of crypto assets. Um, what is the regulation behind crypto assets? Basically, the good news in Bahrain, they were one of the first countries in the Gulf to regulate and to provide regulation on crypto assets. One of the main ones is the payment tokens. We have four different category types of uh, crypto assets based on Bahrain Central Bank, but the main ones we'll focus on today is the exchanges, which means the cryptocurrency exchanges now have a license and are regulated by the central bank based on security requirements, based on regulation requirements, based on infrastructure requirements for them to be able to meet those requirements in order to ensure security for the publics and for user accounts for your wallet addresses on those exchanges. What happens is the central bank has specific security requirements, regulation requirements, technical firewall security requirements that each exchange must adhere to, including capital requirements to make sure they protect the users' wallet addresses and specifically your portfolios in the case of a hack, in the case of bad or disruptions, and the case of fraud activities. So now the exchanges, and this is why they say it's always recommended to use an exchange that is regulated by the central bank because it, it gives you more protection for your funds and for your portfolio on your crypto assets. Okay. So these are the, the firms which are now regulated by the central bank in Bahrain, Rain which offers services across all around the GCC features. Coin Mina, which is recently launched in Bahrain about three, four months ago, also serves the full GCC countries and they also have a cryptocurrency license based in central banks and Bahrain requirements. Uh, currently in Coin Mina, they have an offer that 25%, if you open an account through a referral link, a referral, a referral user link, you'll be able to get $25 in your account, which you can test for free by buying different crypto assets. Then you have other Enables coming in, Facet coming into the picture as well, and enable another uh, cryptocurrency player coming into the regulation, into the sandbox of the Central Bank of Bahrain as well, which they should graduate soon, either this year or the next. So now let's talk about exchanges, how to start, what you can do to start, what you can do to consider for your crypto assets, okay? So one of my contacts, I'll just share this the story with you guys. One of my contacts last year, asked me about cryptocurrency. And he told me, look, Fawaz, and what is this cryptocurrency? There's, there's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of it's high risk. One day it's up, one day it's down. You know, I mean, um, am I going to lose my money if I get into Bitcoin? What's going to happen, you know? So I told him this. I told him, look, do you go to Starbucks or any other coffee shop? 
And he said, yes, I go to Starbucks almost every day before going to work five days a week. I go and I get my latte, my sandwich, and then I, you know, I start the day for work. So I asked him, I asked him, how much do you spend when you go to Starbucks on average? He said, maybe two BD, maybe, you know, three BD, which is like two, 20 dirhams or, you know, 30 dirhams, right? So let's say two BD, which is about 20 dirhams, right? And so he goes five days a week. So that's two BD per, uh, per day. So that's, that's what, two times five, that's 10 BD, which is about 100 dirhams or 100 Saudi rials per week that he spends. So a whole month, he spends about 40 BD, which is about, what, 400 dirhams, right? Or 400 Saudi rials. And uh, so I told him, look, so when you go to Starbucks, and I told him, look, you go to Starbucks, you have your coffee, your latte, you have that, that, that taste of the latte, that sweetness, and then what happens? Five hours later or three hours later, you go to the bathroom and you flush it down the toilet. It's gone out of your system. That 20 BD that you spent is now down to zero. You know, it's out of your system, flushed down the toilet, right? So I, I was like, look, so you're spending 40 BD a month, which goes down the, down the toilet, right? I was like, look, if you buy Bitcoin for 20 BD, which is about 200 dirhams or Ether, I, told, I guarantee you it will never go down to zero. Right, it will never go down to zero. I can guarantee. I can almost guarantee that. It might go up by five percent. It might go down by five percent, but it will never go down to zero. Which do you think is better for you? Right. So he started looking at me. He's like, okay, maybe I, th I think maybe you have a point. Right. So this is something to consider. You don't have to go with with, with hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. You can go go for even get, go into Bitcoin for a very small amount, and you, you can, or Ether, and you can see what happens just to test things out. Right. Uh, chances are. 99.9%, it, no, it will never go down to zero compared to what you spend on other expenses, right? So that's the, that's the uh, analogy here. So another strategy is crypt buying cryptocurrencies like going to the gym or losing weight. Whenever you, let's say you set a goal, if you wanna, if you wanna hit the gym, you wanna buff up, you wanna lose weight, you wanna tone down your muscle, you wanna stay healthy, what do you do? You go and you spend money on joining a gym. So you spend about, what, a 30, 40 BD a month, or which is a 400 dirhams per month if you're in the UAE or Dubai and you join the gym, that's an expense. And you spend, let's say four or five months. Maybe you hire a personal trainer because you have specific goals. So you set a goal, I wanna lose 10 kg in the next three months, for example, or 20 kgs in the last three months. So you hit the gym and then you join the gym for 40, 40, 40 BD a month. Maybe you hire a personal trainer, which is even a higher expense. Maybe you join a subscription program for one of those you know, food uh, subscriptions like that you pay per week, like Calo or any others like Healthy Kitchen and others, that's another expense, right? But you all bring those expenses as investment to reach your goal. So cryptocurrency is similar. The way they recommend for you set a goal and then work towards it. So one goal could be like, okay, I want to I wanna make a profit in cryptocurrency uh, of $1,000 in six months, for example, right? I want to make a profit of $2,000 in cryptocurrency trading for the next 10 months or for the next year right? And you work towards that goal. And you say, okay, then you, you go and you put in $100 for cryptocurrency, let's say Bitcoin or Ether or anything, and you watch it grow. It goes up and down by 5%. It goes up by 10%. Then you sell it. You made a profit. You take the profit and you put it in another coin, maybe Ether, maybe another cryptocurrency, and you keep going to reach your goal, right? That's the recommended strategy for going into cryptocurrency. That, that's you set a goal and you work towards it, just like losing weight, just like going to the gym, just like if you want to tone up, just like if you want to eat healthy and stay healthy and so on, right? That's the recommended approach. You can always go and buy blindly and just see what happens. That's fine, but always set a goal. Many people learn by simply just going and trying things out. Others like to analyze and assess the market, evaluate what's happening, ask people for their professional opinion, and then jump in. Every person has their own learning style on how to jump into anything new. Some people like to jump in immediately and see what happens and then test things out and then go. Others have previous experience, so they like to, to, to go and just see what happens. So that's what they do and that's how they, how they learn. That's up to you. But always set a goal of what you want to achieve with cryptocurrency and work towards it slowly by slowly. And always invest the money that you can afford to lose, right? It will not impact your, your, um, uh, your lifestyle or your family's lifestyle. Now let's talk about two main important points in cryptocurrency, a stable cryptocurrency and alternative crypto coins. What do they mean? Stable cryptocurrency means cryptocurrency that is pegged to an asset such as fiat currency. It can be gold or assets or, for example, US dollars or euros. For example, examples of uh, stable coins are BUSD, 
which is linked to the US dollar, which means the value of BUSD as a cryptocurrency stable coin is always going to be equivalent to the US dollar, which is 3.78 uh, in terms of BD, right? USDC is another type of a stable coin and USDT, USD Tether, which is also both of them are pegged to the US dollar value, which means they always are equal to $1. One USDC is equal to $1. One USDT is always equal to $1. Why is this important? Because for people who are trading different cryptocurrency coins, um, doing the exchange rate between a stable coin and any other crypto asset is much easier because you can do the conversions and you will not miss the, the conversion rates. It's very easy to convert. However, if you start converting between, for example, Bitcoin and other alternative coin like Ether, the range is so high because one Bitcoin is equal to $35,000 or $40,000 and then Ether is $2,000. So when you exchange the rate between the two, it's very confusing of how much you'd be making a profit. So when you always compare against USDC or USDC, it's much easier for calculation purposes. And you will always know where you stand when you are buying or selling or when it goes up or down. And it's very easy for you to go and put your money into a stable coin, into USDC on the exchange, and then exchanging that from USDC into Ether or into Bitcoin or into Litecoin or any other cryptocurrency that you fancy or that you find attractive for you to make that sale, it be, uh, that buy or sell. It becomes very, very easy. Alternative coins or also known as altcoins are basically all the different crypto assets that we see uh, that we have right now. There's over 40,000 altcoins in the market today. Monero, Zcash, Terra Luna, Sand, HNT, You've got many other, you've got Matic, M-A-T-I-C, you've got uh, Poly, uh, Polkadot coin as, as well. There's many others and almost new cryptocurrency altcoins are coming into the market almost on a monthly basis. On average, there's about brand new 1,000 cryptocurrency altcoins are coming into the, uh, into the market on every single month. So you have to be aware of what's happening in the market. Some of them are 0.0005, some of them are 0.02, some of them are $3, such as, for example, Solana now is about maybe, I think it's about $50 or $75 and so on. There's something called Celo, and there's many other to look for. Altcoins are all known as alternative tokens or alternative coins because they are, um, they are very low in value, but they have very high uh, transaction rates. So you can buy 100 units of Shiba coin for, for like $0.0056, and you can buy 100, 200, 300 for very small amounts. And you can, and if once they jump by 20, 40%, you can sell that coin and make an immediate profit. And the volatility in altcoins is extremely high. The swings of ups and downs is extremely high. They can go up by 50%, they can go down by 50%, which means you can make a high, a high amount of profit, or you can lose a lot of a lot of money in a very short span. So be very, very wary of when it when it comes to alternative coins and what happens with it. Now. What type of traders are available in the market and what you should consider, right? Investors are basically uh, experienced traders. They come from inst institutional investors. They always trade of more than $100,000 in their portfolios. These are advanced experienced traders and they come from institutional investors or even hedge fund subscribers. Long-term traders, which are basically average people like you and me, small time, they invest maybe $1,000. Maybe they invest like um, $2,000. And they go and they buy and they keep it for a month, two months, three months. And then they make a profit of 5% or 10%. And then they sell it and they go and put it in other coins, right? It, the, the portfolio range can range from $10,000, maybe even $20,000. But basically their, their strategies, they buy and hold over the long term, over six months, over nine months, over 10 months. And then they sell it back and they see what's happening, right? That, those are the majority of traders in the market today. They, they start off as long term and they see what happens and they keep on going on. Then you have day traders. Day traders are people who are trading on a daily basis and they're spending anywhere between four hours per day to nine hours per day. Per day. So basically they're spending the whole day just trading back and forth, buying and selling, buying and selling different crypto tokens. And they make high value transactions on the actual exchange, but they sell like small amounts, like $10, $3, $4, $3, $2, let's say, 200 transactions in, in, in one day. And they make small amounts of profit within those transactions. So they end up making maybe $200 per day in profit. 
or $300 per day in profit. So in one week, they make like over, in 10 days, they make over $3,000, but they spend their whole day trading. Those are people, experienced traders, who usually come from, let's say, different backgrounds or foreign exchange background, or even stock trading backgrounds, or even bond trading background, or gold or oil. These are experienced people who are also doing this, right? So choose where you want to be, and then go from there. Maybe you want to be a long-term person. The average people, they just want to be a long-term person. They just want to be able to see what's happening, and they just go and trade and see what's going on, right? So what you should do, what you shouldn't do, the do's and don'ts of trading. First of all, no one can predict the price of Bitcoin. Be very careful about that. Anyone who tells you Bitcoin is going to go up or down, they're basically, it's only their personal opinion, right? Um, uh, it's Nobody can predict because the Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency are based on supply and demand. So you can believe, please don't believe them. Take it under consideration, but do your own research before buying or getting into any cryptocurrency, right? Don't just listen to someone and just go and go buy it. No, do your own research, be cautious, do your analysis, and then go and buy in. So anybody who tells you, Bitcoin or Ether is going to go up by 20% by next week. You can buy now. Don't, you can listen to them, but don't just take action only what they say, right? Now, based on that number two, there are always market indicators that can tell us, that give us clues where the Bitcoin is going uh, based on the news, based on big investors, based on government announcements and so on. For example, um, Russia three weeks ago said that they, they're going to be banning mining or they're going to make mining of cryptocurrency, make it illegal. Right. And this has actually sent shockwaves across, across the crypto market. Suddenly people said, oh, they're going to ban mining of cryptocurrency. The people started selling all their Bitcoins. Right. And so the Bitcoin prices are going down. China banned actually Bitcoin. And they said suddenly uh, we're going to ban mining of Bitcoin, Bitcoin cryptocurrency. And then people start selling and so on. So this are, oh, there's, there's always market indicators that give you clues about the market. High risk. Yes. The Bitcoin cryptocurrency is very volatile and very high risk compared to other cryptocurrencies such as, such, such as investment, such as gold or oil or bonds markets. So be very careful of that. It is highly volatile. The common users, most common users, they buy and hold of the cryptocurrency and see what happens and then they go from there. Now, there are, there are other options of cryptocurrency trade that can give you uh, uh, more advantages, how to improve your profits, such as crypto bots, such as copy trading. I'll talk more about that in the next slides. These are all different methods for you to be able to improve your chances of success in cryptocurrencies. Again, there is no guarantees. There is no 100% guarantee that you will make a profit. There are different tools that you can use to improve your positions to make more profit in cryptocurrency. One of the most important points about cryptocurrency is learn to manage your risk. You, uh, learn where you are about risk. Some people have a higher risk um, appetite. Others have a low risk appetite. People who own their own companies tend to have a higher risk appetite because of their experience. So they, they like to take bigger risks. They like to invest with bigger amounts in crypto. They like to take, take the leap of faith and see what happens. People who worked in companies for 10, 15 years, they, their risk appetite is lower. They like to keep, a, they're very cautious. They want to analyze, evaluate, assess, and then make a decision and take action by jumping into crypto. Learn where you are, where you stand, and then go ahead and make the decision and jump into cryptocurrency and see what happens. Almost always the recommendation is maybe spend $100 into Bitcoin or Ether, see what happens, keep it for three, four months, watch it go up and down, and then go from there. If you make a profit, maybe sell it and then get into another cryptocurrency and then go from there. That's fine. Learn at your own pace, be comfortable where you are, and then see what happens. And then maybe you'll make better positions, bigger positions, and so on. Your capacity for loss is always how much you can afford to lose. The advice is always the more money you invest in high risk assets such as crypto, the more growth potential you have, but also the more chance of a capital loss. So always understand the risks in, in investing in cryptocurrency and manage it accordingly based on your, uh, your, your, your preference. So uh, well, just to time keeping, we are, we are uh, almost uh, out of time. So if we can... Uh, finalize the presentation, please, so we can jump into the panel discussion. Okay, Thank perfect. You. So I'll just take this uh, this one last slide. So this gives you the options of what we're going to be, uh, what you have options in trading in Bahrain or you're li living in the GCC countries. Each one has different options with it. Binance and Crypto.com and CoinMina each have different options. For example, the the, the fees on, on CoinMina is 0.7% on the buy and sell, uh, whereas other exchanges have different higher fees. So um, you can try, you can test each one of them and see which one works for you, and then go from there. And then we'll talk more about in the, in the Q and A. 
Uh, this one I talked about the copy trading. eToro.com offers copy trading where you can actually copy your portfolio um, uh, to people who are experienced and you can let your, your portfolio copy experienced traders automatically where you can set your buys and sells based on other experienced traders. And then you can actually um, watch your portfolio grow up and down based on experienced traders and how they make money, based, maybe 10% high or 20% high and so on. Bot trading is another new area now where you can actually use uh, automated bots for you to make your trades automatically using different tools, Shrimpy, NatBots.com. These are all different tools available, which gives you bot trading options uh, available. Now, uh, I'll talk more about that maybe in the, in the Q&A. You have staking options, you have crypto loans, but I'll keep that in the, in the Q&A where you can actually ask about that. What are the options for staking? Because you can make money only by keeping your cryptocurrency uh, wallets on the actual exchange, okay? So let's go ahead and jump into the q and I'll just jump here and um, I'll let um, Ahmed take it from there and we can just let um, Ahmed do the introduction. We can take it from there. Go ahead, Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Fawaz. Uh, very informative. We, uh, I hope we could have more time, but uh, you know, that's the, always the case. Uh, thank you, very, very informative uh, session. Now we move to the panel discussion. Uh, we have, if you have any questions to ask, please type it in the Q&A and we'll try our level best uh, to answer them. Uh, with us in the panel discussion, uh, Mr. Khalid Saad, he's the uh, board member of CoinMina, which I was uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, Khalid, uh, very known figure, he was the founding CEO of Bahrain Fintech Bay. He's an advisor to Zero One Systems, a board member of uh, APAL. Khaled, thank you for joining us. And we're really looking forward to having a, a very fruitful uh, discussion. So thank, thank you for joining. That's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, Khaled. Um, Fawaz and Khaled, we have a very interesting uh, topic in our hand and we'll leave the floor uh, to uh, our esteemed attendees who made the time to, uh, to come. And uh, maybe I'll just kick off uh, the um, uh, panel discussion with one question, is that um, you, we always hear digital currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies. We've even heard uh, His Excellency, the governor of CBD, two weeks back in his address to um, uh, the parliament that uh, things like Bitcoin and so on is not actually currencies. They are uh, classified as uh, a, a, as an asset. And he also uh, warned against uh, trading in them because of, uh, without being cautious because of volatility, lack of control. So uh, can you tell us what's the difference between digital currencies and cryptocurrencies? Call it if you can. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. I think it's it's a, it's a whole matter of, of perception. And I think the naming is a bit deceiving. Obviously, when you mention currencies, that it becomes uh, a matter of you know money being issued by a central bank or a central authority of a country. And then obviously the concept of crypto uh, currencies came up and then that caused confusion in terms of people understanding it as another form of money. Now, obviously, um, cryptocurrencies you know, such as Bitcoin or others, they could be used as a you know medium for payment. That's one thing. The way I see them, and you, know, you can call them crypto assets, digital assets, they're more of securities in terms of yeah, just like like stocks or other things, you know, they, the price goes up and down based on demand. There are different utilities, as Fawaz has already explained to a lot of these uh, crypto assets or cryptocurrencies, if you may put it. Um, obviously, Fawaz touched upon what he called the stable coins in terms of these are crypto assets or cryptocurrencies that are backed uh, by, let's say, a U.S. dollar. And therefore, their fluctuation kind of moves also with, with the currencies. And so that, that, you know, some people might call that a currency, others might not. 
So, so for me, if you ask me, um, I'd rather see them as assets or normal securities where, you know, there is a utility behind each of them. Obviously, some of the alternative coins don't have any utility at all. And I think part of the, you mentioned His Excellency's warning a few weeks ago, was mentioning cases of coins that don't exhibit clear utility. Some of the projects that Fawaz was talking about actually have actual solid projects with a verifiable track record uh, that's been going on for years. Now, obviously that's, that's traditional, let's say cryptocurrencies or crypto assets. So I think the name is a bit deceiving. And I think for people, it might be confusing. Now, obviously central banks, on the other hand, some of them might be warning against your traditional cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, but then they're promoting and piloting a central bank digital currency. And then for them, they might view that as a form of money or currency. So I guess this might even confuse people even more. Um, but obviously the purpose is completely different between the two. So I think in, in, for simplicity's sake, you should view them as a normal security or just a digital asset you know, backed by, by a project where there is a utility behind it. Uh, thank you, Khaled. Fawaz, if you would like uh, to pitch in on this uh, question as well, please. Uh, yes, um, I, I definitely agree with the point that Khaled mentioned. Um, uh, uh, it is a bit confusing. And see, basically, if you look at the history, when Bitcoin came up, it come, uh, the, the main aim of the project was to be a currency where people can trade it and use it for every day, for every transaction. But that did not succeed. That did, that did not work until today. Right, because the transaction uh, is very slow and uh, you can't confirm transactions and so on. Then Ethereum came to the picture and others trying to do the same thing. Again, it's done, but people used it as a store of value. So it became more closer to an asset for you to be able to store it as an asset and then sell it, uh, sell it later as, as, uh, as So the performance of a, a cryptocurrency token like Ether, Bitcoin, and others is more, follows more similar to stocks or other assets that are traded on a, on a marketplace, the performance of it. That's why it's considered more as, a, um, uh, as, a, as an asset and what the central bank are referring to, right? That's where my, uh, my point is. Thank I think, you. Ahmed, if I uh, maybe just add another point, just building up on Fawaz's point, I think if you see a lot of institutional investors and even you know, a lot of, let's say, the more experienced retail investors, they now view crypto assets or cryptocurrencies as an alternative asset class. And so when they're doing their investment portfolio construction, uh, you know, they might have an allocation for equities, fixed income, real estate alternatives. Now you start seeing an allocation also to crypto assets or cryptocurrencies. Yes. And so they, they view that also from that perspective. So the positioning of the industry has fundamentally changed. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, maybe before we jump into other questions, uh, maybe we take some questions from our attendees. One question was very interesting, and, and uh, you, uh, we were supposed to cover it maybe in the presentation, but because of time. Uh, Khalid Wahid says, what do you think about mining? Is it profitable in long term and it's worth exploring? Because now we can trade and buy uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, but at the same time, there's another alternative, which is mining them instead of buying them and trading them. So uh, what do you think uh, about mining as a strategy in, in terms of uh, dealing with the cryptocurrency? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it, it obviously all started with the uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. And I think as when Bitcoin initially came up, the computation or the computer power required to conduct the computations to verify you know, the different blocks was far less. And obviously as, as you know, the years have gone by, the required mining effort to actually conduct these computations has become very significant as the complexity has increased significantly. So obviously the, the calculation or the equation has changed. So if, for example, you're looking at, you know, buying one miner maybe for Bitcoin and putting it in, you have to factor in, I think one, how much, you know, upfront cost will that cost you? Two, 
Um, what is the electricity cost, you know, where you are? That's another factor that you would need to obviously factor in. And this is why you see a lot of, for example, miners, when they left from China, they've gone to Kazakhstan, some have moved to Georgia, we've seen some in Iceland, a very strategic locations where obviously you might get renewable energy, but the electricity cost is low, relatively speaking. There is a big mining farm actually in Kuwait. Now, obviously, if you flip the equation and think about maybe mining Bitcoin in Bahrain, it's maybe a different story. You, you would require a scale to get meaningful return. There were the odd instances where somebody with very low mining capacity ended up getting a big reward, but you know, you're probably more likely to be hit by lightning than actually get that reward, you know. So the, the, the odds are very low. Now, on the flip side. There are other um, crypto assets or cryptocurrencies that you can start mining. Obviously, uh, Avalanche, there's Helium. So there are quite, quite a few others which are at an earlier stage. And obviously, once you do the calculation, the payout period might be over X number of months, but it ends up being a rewarding strategy. I think the way I'd look at it um, is, you know, you've got, you trade on one side, it could be a buy and hold, it could be a, you know, short-term or medium-term trading strategy it could be day trading depending on what we got and then the mining also could complement that and you know generates for you a alternative revenue stream so I, I guess it depends on what you want to mine what is the scale of the mining and also the you factor in the cost in there so it's not just how much you will be generating per month how much would you cost you also in terms of electricity cooling etc for you to to keep mining. Uh, thank you, uh, Khaled. Uh, we'll take another question from uh, uh, the attendees. Um, um, one is... Um, Ahmed, can I add one more point? I think it's go important. Ahead, yes. go ahead. I think go ahead. also what we've seen, you've seen now um, there's proof of work and there's also proof of stake. So. What used to happen is before you'd get your miner, start computing, you'd get a bit of revenue. Now, uh, newer protocols is, you know, you buy a certain, let's say Solana, for example, you'd buy certain amounts of Solana, you would stake that uh, on the protocol. Some exchanges would do that staking and you, you'd get a certain return uh, as a result. And that doesn't require any mining of, uh, you know, devices or, or machinery. So now, and it requires obviously significantly less uh, energy and, and cost. So that's also the alternative in terms of the traditional mining. Great point. And for us, this question is for you. Um, you are using investment as a keyword. Investment has a fundamentals that include measurable quantitative data, for example. Don't you think we should use speculation or gambling as the fundamental of investing uh, of investment is missing um <clears throat> uh, if this was uh, if this was back in 2009 2010 i would say yes it would be much more uh gambling but now because we saw uh there's a lot of profit happening people became uh, millionaires of from cryptocurrency investing so now the biggest uh, the biggest advantage is like you can actually invest in cryptocurrency. You can buy ten thousand and then you keep it and then you can make a profit. So now it's it no longer became that uh, it's only pure gambling or it's only pure luck. It became that there are now uh, like specific strategies that you can follow and you can actually do make a profit. So that's why it's uh, the, the the term now it's much more closer to investments rather than just pure gambling or pure luck or just 50%, you know. And to prove that point, um, as Mr. Khal mentioned earlier, that um, a lot of the hedge funds and banks are, use, are, are deploying their portfolios using crypto assets. And they're selling as hedge funds for people to subscribe, even as institution investors, because they realize the potential return on it after six months, after one year, that there is a huge return. So now it became a lot more closer to an investment in crypto assets, as you see. Uh, thank you for us. Uh, this question is uh, for uh, Paolo. Uh, as as Fawaz mentioned, we have Rain, we have Coin Coin Mina. Now we've heard about, about Binance being regulated in Bahrain. 
Uh, why, are the, why are you choosing Bahrain despite the small market, relatively speaking? Yeah, that's a very good question, Ahmed. I think you know Bahrain might see people might see Bahrain as a small jurisdiction, but in Bahrain you actually have one an onshore, very clear and robust regulatory framework for crypto assets. Now, if you look at it from an onshore per, uh, jurisdiction perspective in the region, Bahrain is the only place in in the region that actually has these regulations on a federal or central bank level. The alternative at the moment is in Abu Dhabi via the Abu Dhabi Global Market HGM, which is a dedicated free zone. They do also have um, their own set of uh, crypto regulations. And we saw also in bed that they also want to be creating their own uh, crypto zone via the Dubai World Trade Center, uh, also dealing with the Emirates uh, Commodities and Securities Commission. Now, so Bahrain has one of the best regulatory frameworks and regimes uh, in the world, actually. And it's not just in the region. Uh, the, obviously, the reputation of the central bank is excellent. So that lends credibility in terms of you being regulated by the central bank. And crypto assets, probably unlike many industries, maybe traditionally, you wouldn't put cryptocurrencies or crypto assets and regulation in in one sentence, but as it becomes more mainstream, as the industry develops further, um, it is also an industry that is uh, seeking further credibility and also regulations, smart regulations, let me add. And, and, and Bahrain is actually a jurisdiction that gives you that. And it's very important, especially, uh, you know, with every new emerging industry, arbitrary things happen. So it's important also for investors to have that comfort and security that any exchange that you will be dealing with is highly regulated, well-governed. Um, and obviously in Bahrain, you have to be that, otherwise you'll not get licensed. I think also very importantly, financial institutions have also shown an appetite to be servicing uh, Crypto assets, and obviously it's 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 a very new industry, and you know the tendency for people if they don't understand a new industry is to say no. That's usually the easiest thing, but as things become more mainstream, financial institutions are now more and more so starting to also embrace to start off with crypto exchanges and ultimately maybe different crypto projects. So Bahrain offers that combination. Uh, for everybody. And this is why you, you see multiple exchanges being fully regulated uh, here in Bahrain. And obviously, it took years to reach this stage. Uh, and it, it requires a different mindset shift. And, and, and Bahrain has built, obviously, their track record and regulations over the past few years. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, can I just add a point anything? on that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, uh, Exactly true, as, as what Khalid said. In, in addition, I, I think that the banks in Bahrain uh, should view this as an opportunity because now the regulation uh, opens the door and it confirms that the, there is regulation. You can now, the bank can actually provide products and services with the crypto as being um, uh, incorporated into their products and services, which means if they want, they want to be able to compete using that they can because the, the CBB gives them the uh, regulation authority to, to, to do so. So they can leverage it as, as an opportunity. Now we're seeing internationally, like for example, Compound, they're offering loans on your cryptocurrency wallet. So you can actually, let's say, for example, I'm looking for a loan of $10,000. If I have like, uh, like, like six ethers in my wallet, I can, I can put my, uh, my ether in the Compound application and it will lock the amount and I will make monthly payment against that loan if I want to make, the, let's say, $10,000. And I keep making monthly payments and uh, they give me uh, the, the interest they charge is extremely low compared to retail banks in the country, like almost half. So this is now you're going to see people uh, leveraging their wallets and getting a loan from these, um, they're called decentralized finance DeFi applications, and then being able to, and then you're going to see a different shift from people going more into crypto assets versus going to the traditional loans within the bank because the interest rates is much higher in comparison to other options. Yeah. Thanks, Fawaz. Um, Khaled, you spoke about regulations and the importance of regulation. 
But uh, does that mean uh, trading on these uh, exchanges, even if they are regulated, are secure? So, um, you know, we've heard a lot about people, uh, some exchanges being hacked, uh, people losing their money, while even they are regulated. So how secure is trading on these exchanges? Ahmed, it, it, it depends, I think, on to start off with the regulatory framework that you're under. So I think that's one important pillar to look at. Um, from what perspective? Let's say if I'm looking at Bahrain, uh, for example, sake, exchanges need to one have proper cybersecurity governance, a proper security architecture that needs you know to to meet all sorts of stringent rules. And you know we're not we're not talking only you know the full suite of AML compliance, cyber requirements, segregation of company and client funds, which I think a lot of international exchanges that are not regulated don't have that. So you know uh, the two founders or a founder that that owns the exchange can disappear one day, and with that, all of the funds of the clients are gone. So obviously, these are important things to be looking at. Uh, custody is extremely important and obviously uh, you would need to be holding the majority of client funds and cold wallets and some top custodians globally so that that means that you know if something wrong happens you know you, you don't end up losing a hundred percent of your funds and you know both the organization's funds and the client's funds now so the you know there's a combination that is is very important that you know you have the right foundations from one client protection client fund segregation uh, proper custody proper cyber security uh, architecture but so that 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 is from an exchange perspective and obviously well governed jurisdictions mandate that and you would need to get all of that approved before you actually start your operations on. Um, from an individual perspective, it's also very important that you know you would protect your account further by enabling things like a Google Authenticator. You know it could be you know, two-factor authentication, passwords, etc. So you know you the, the the exchange will have security requirements, but also at the same time individually, you would enable those extra security measures. Um, that doesn't mean and you know you can never say that no matter how highly regulated, etc., some incidents might not happen. It happens to to banks and other institutions. So you know, but at a base level, all of these uh, safety requirements need to be there for the comfort of one, well, both regulators and investors, whether they're retail investors or institutional investors. Thank you, Fahid. Fawaz, would you like to add anything on the security of uh, how secure is trading on Bahrain exchanges or any other exchanges? Uh, yes, I definitely. I, I definitely agree with what with, with, with Khalid said, and it definitely adds uh, more to it. Uh, it's always okay. There's not. There's no such thing as 100% secure, right? There's always that risk. But when you go to the regulated exchange, then these guys go through multiple layers of regulation requirements. One of them is firewalls. One of them is cybersecurity policies and so on. And they have to always adhere to them. And then the central bank sends them every quarter um, inspectors to check that they are confirming to those policies on a quarterly basis. So the exchange is always up to date in terms of his security requirements implement to protect your accounts, your user accounts for the cold storage. For example, one regulation requirements I, I learned about recently is that um, the CEOs and the founders do not have access to the private keys of the wallet addresses of their users, which this is a huge regulation requirement, which protects your user accounts uh, from, um, you know, bad actors, fraudulent acts, and so on. So this is, uh, it's always safer to go to the regulated exchange than when non-regulated exchange for these different reasons. Okay. And uh, speaking of security, and, and as you mentioned that, uh, there are a lot of coins and cryptocurrencies being created. How do we spot uh, spammy or fraudulent uh, new currencies coming in the market? So for me, um, I see up here that this new coin is coming. 
that will be the next uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. People start uh, buying them. And all of a sudden we hear that the founders disappeared, they took the money and nowhere to be found. How do we spot those uh, scams or fraud uh, accounts? Okay, uh, great question. And many people ask that question a lot. So uh, the simple answer is one, there's no magic formula to be able to spot this. There's always that risk. But what people are doing now, um, for example, you look at the coins structure, the project it handles, what's the purpose, what's the objective? You know, you look at the founders, do those founders have experience in previous startups or ventures? Is the venture being backed by an international venture capitalist firm? There are some coins being backed by Coinbase ventures, such as CELO or CELO and others. These tend to have higher credibility. You look at, at what stage this project is at. Is it in beta? Is it in alpha stage? Have they done testing? You look at what clients they signed up with. For example, there's some coins which, which signed up with multi um, telecom oper mobile telecom operators in Europe, and they start testing with that and promoting that service through the subscribers of, like for example, Dutch Telecom, Tele Telefonica, and others. So this gives the startup much more credibility in terms of where they are. And this gives you much closer, let's say, um, a better informed decision to go and buy that coin versus a coin that has no real backing, no objective, is not adding any value to the marketplace, has no significant product or service behind it, right? Thank you. And uh, uh, now that uh, people are interested in, in joining, uh, how is it easy? What is required to join these regulated exchanges in Bahrain? Yes, it's a, it's a fairly easy process. And I think it's, a, it's a normally a user-friendly process. Obviously, to get it to be this simplified, there's a lot going on in the background uh, to make it. But usually, uh, to, to get a basic account, you know, that is that wouldn't allow you to trade, you'd need a, a name, an email, a mobile number. Now to get fully verified uh, to, to be allowed to trade, you'd obviously would require identification. Now, depending whether you know you, that would be ID, passports, um, where you're from, uh, an address, a bank statement. Now people might wonder, why do you need a bank statement for regulatory purposes? you would want to be associating a particular individual with a certain bank account. There's, there's uh, extensive AML, uh, I'm gonna put a terrorist financing regulations that need to be adhered to. And there are a lot of systems that check for all of these. And that's normally, that's usually what you would require. It's, uh, and obviously once you upload your identification, you would do a quick facial authentication just to verify that and liveliness check to verify that the individual that is actually submitting the application is the exact same individual that is on the IDs. Um, and that happens more or less instantaneously. And then it goes for just a, the moment you complete the process, if you have the documents in hand, this process takes a few minutes at, at the most. So it's not, you know, the extensive process that you would need to go through um, to do that. And then obviously it goes for, application goes for review, gets reviewed by the compliance team and, and you're set. And then you would be able to fund your account. You, you can either do it via the bank account that you've actually associated um, or some people prefer to use a credit card to fund their account and then they can cash it out or withdraw it to that same bank account that they've attached to their uh, um, to their uh, account. So it's a very fairly straightforward process that is streamlined, um, passes all the regulatory checks, but it's also done in a very user-friendly and easy way. Thank you. Carl. Maybe just for uh, the sake of time, we we'll, uh... You know, uh, we have a lot of other questions, but unfortunately we cannot answer all of them. Maybe just a concluding uh, remarks, uh, gentlemen. Now we're talking about trading, we're, tra we're talking about mining. How do you foresee the future of uh, cryptocurrencies? 
are we going to anytime seeing replacing the fiat currency or the actual the currencies that we use or uh, how do you see it? Uh, for us, if you can uh, give us your thoughts and your concluding uh, remarks. Um, my personal view, I think, I don't think it will replace fiat. I think it's going to be an additional payment method like credit cards that people use to make to make payments because it has it has advantage. For example, now in Dubai, you go to car showrooms, you can actually pay for your car with cryptocurrency. Uh, the advantage there is for business owners and for like merchants who own sh stores or shops on Instagram or Facebook, and they sell their stuff. Currently, if they accept credit card transactions, they have to pay 3% on each transaction. With cryptocurrency, they don't incur that charge, right? So it's much more profitable for them to be able to accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment in comparison to credit card. So I think it's going to be much more popular. And we've, we've seen that happening in the US and UK markets and mature markets as well. Right, that's what I think. Khaled, uh, your thoughts yeah, and concluding Yeah, remarks. absolutely. Just a quick point, actually. For was to your presentation uh, about Coimina, you could withdraw to any wallets from Coimina. Maybe just I want to clarify that point okay. that that is allowed. So, you know, you, you buy from Coimina, you can send it to any other wallet that you want. As a concluding um, remark, I'm pretty bullish about the outlook for, for crypto. Uh, and I and, and you know, to for this point, I, it will exist in parallel with your traditional currencies. So, you know, you'll have your paper currency, you're gonna have your central bank digital currencies, and then you're gonna have crypto assets or the other cryptocurrencies that you want. And and to me, people think it's maybe a bit too late. They saw Bitcoin's been around for over a decade, but we're just at the beginning of this crypto revolution and transformation, I think most people still cannot comprehend, you know, what a big shift this will be. I think to me, there are two things. One, we'll see probably crypto will result in the biggest transfer of wealth, I think maybe in history or definitely in our history with time. Um, as Fawaz pointed out, it might not happen overnight or in a few months, but Long term for people that uh, stay in the industry, they've been rewarded handsomely. So I think one, two, from a financial services perspective, it's a big transformation uh, because a lot of these projects are absolutely unique and their scale is huge. And with the you know, advent of decentralized finance, I think the financial system in itself is seeing a fundamental shift. And individuals now have a very meaningful alternative. Maybe it might look a bit obscure or complicated to those that you know, haven't dabbled in the industry, but it is you know, an industry that has tens of billions of dollars or maybe hundreds of billions of dollars already in it. And it's just starting. Um, and, and for me, institutional uptake is key that this industry is not you know a an experimental industry but now it's starting to become mainstream and the last you know over the last week we've seen black rock which is the world's largest asset manager with 10 trillion dollars you know that would be the third largest economy if it was an economy in itself now offering crypto trading to its clients so if the world's largest asset manager is jumping in this is an industry that is uh here to stay so i think in the region we're, we're at the beginning uh, more and more people are, you know, growing their awareness about this industry. And it's also a good, good way to, to take part in this whole digital journey or digital new digital economy, you know, by starting to dabble into crypto assets. And I think we're just in the beginning and we will see fundamental changes moving on forward. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, I apologize for, uh, all the attendees that were unable to answer the questions, their questions. As uh, Michal Al-Hiru said, this will raise more questions than answers. Uh, it's a very vast uh, topic, uh, but I think uh, Mr. Fawaz and Khalid, well, we thank you very much uh, for joining us. We thank uh, Technology and Business Society for having this event. And I sincerely thank you all the attendees for coming to this event. I request from you that once you end this webinar, you answer uh, the survey that will pop up and tell us what events you would like 
uh, TBS to arrange in the future. And thank you very much and have a lovely day. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And thank thanks you for, for being thank here. You, Pleasure. Thank you. 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 Uh, Ahmed, I think <laughs> I think one comment in the chat they, they said they want to have a similar event on NFTs. Maybe something we can consider in the future. <laughs> uh, we'll discuss it with Michelle, inshallah, and we could uh, definitely NFTs, metaverse, uh, all of hey, these. <laughs> are this. And cryptocurrencies actually play an important role in, in, in this in your digital world. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, okay. thank you. Inshallah. All right. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Take care. Yeah, I'll take you, Mal Fafi, inshallah. Allah, I'll see you.